Wrong with me. Let me try again. I think they're good. Oh well. I just lost it in my old age. I can't shoot anymore. I'm sorry. Hickok 45. Yes, percussion revolver. It had the percussion, uh, but that's all it had. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about conversions today, and uh, and a little bit about this particular gun, the the 1858 new model Army. A percussion uh, revolver that was used uh, so widely in the Old West and in the Civil War. Okay, so this one's a kind of a cut off version of it. It's kind of a sheriff's model, you'd say. It's a Uberti, and we appreciate uh, Taylor's and Company uh, sending it to us. It's a neat gun. Uberti does a great job on these uh, these reproduction uh, revolvers. There is no doubt about it. Okay, even though they cannot put bullets where they don't exist so we just have caps in that and let's uh, make sure they're all we had six of them go off so we're okay on that okay we're going to talk about uh, another alternative here as you might have guessed now this other one is the same as you can tell 58 new model army revolver and for those of you who are not as familiar with the remingtons maybe you've seen a lot of the colts and a lot of people love the colts uh, these uh, were patented in 58, but uh, they really didn't go into production in any major way until about 61, I think. And uh, they were used in the Civil War. I think there was a fire in the Colt factory in the, right during the middle of the Civil War. So they actually used more of these. They were a little bit more expensive, but the military ordered even more of them. Soldiers like them. I've always had a, oh, I don't know, a love-hate relationship with these things because they're kind of ungainly and big. They, they don't have that great feel in, in a way that the Colts do, but they've grown on me over the years, to tell you the truth. Uh, they really have. I used to not like them at all, but I have uh, developed a bit of fondness for them, partly because I've gotten used to the feel, and they also work better. They're easier to load and get the cylinders out generally. Uh, and and uh, the, you know they, they discovered that, of course, back in the day, too. It's not just a modern realization on my part. If you could go back and interview some uh, Civil War soldiers, they'd uh, quite often they'd choose one of these because they were just more trouble-free. They're very strong. They had the top strap, just like the you know, Colt Single Action Army or the Remington Model 1875 that came out, the cartridge gun that you know, was well-built, too. So... Uh, these things are very, very historical. And what we're gonna kind of look at to here, uh, the main purpose is to kind of look at the conversion issues. Now there's lots of different conversions. There were a lot of people that did conversions. There's a lot of them out there today, a lot of different ways to convert them. Some of them are authentic, some are not. I am not an expert on them. But I wanted to show you a couple of things and, and touch on at least one or two aspects you know, of that. And you might not have known, but Remington was early on uh, involved in the conversions, they they actually paid royalties to Smith and Wesson, and I think it was '68 uh, for the rights to the board through cylinder. You know what a board through cylinder is? It's one of these where you can put a cartridge in it. You know, you know. So seems like a simple thing, doesn't it? But uh, Colt couldn't do that till the patents ran out, and Smith held the patents on that. That's why they were so long coming out with conversions and the Colt Single Action Army for one one reason. Smith had the, and that's why Smith had the Schofields and the Model 3s out early. They held the patent on being able to do that. Isn't that funny? Well, Remington bit the bullet and uh, they paid Smith and Wesson so they could do that pretty early on, actually before the Schofield was out there and before the Colt conversions or anything. So these guns were out there in conversions, cartridge conversions in uh, 68. Okay, so and you can you can find rep reproductions of these today. You know, Taylor's and Company has them. Other people have them. You'll see them in gun shops, and uh, they're they're fairly true to the originals, but not exactly right. So they've got a, a wider plate on the back of the cylinder and some different things, but they are cartridge conversions, and uh, they're in the spirit of the original conversions. All right, 
So conversions can get a little dicey. I'm always careful what I <laughs> have to say about conversions because I don't know everything about them, just enough to be dangerous. And they're kind of an it's an interesting period in our history. It really is firearms history where we uh, we move from the percussion revolvers to the converted uh, percussion revolvers, and then into the revolvers that were made to handle uh, cartridges. So interesting period. Lots of different things going on. There were a lot of you know, uh, backyard gunsmiths who would actually convert these things. Uh, and then the factories would make conversions like they did of this in uh, 68 and all that. So, but anyway, we also have one of these modern conversions. Now there was no, nothing exactly like this, to my knowledge, back in the 1860s, exactly like this, but it's the same principle. And and these are available, uh, Taylor's and the company sent this to me too, so it's kind of neat uh, to play with. But this is a cylinder that you can replace the percussion cylinders with and then fire uh, cartridges. And we're going to do that. All right. Now, these are, you can get these for uh, the Colt, uh, uh, the Colt you know, percussion pistols, the, gosh, the Dragoon, the Walker Colts, all of those, uh, the Navy, 51 Navy, and everything. Now, one advantage, again, to the Remington was it's pretty simple. You don't have to hammer out a wedge and all that. You just pull that out and you got it on, on half cock. And if you're lucky, you can just pull that thing out of there. You turn it kind of clockwise to push the hand up there. And uh, sometimes they'll surprise you and come out very easily. Sometimes this will surprise you and go in easily. But these are brand new. This is a brand new pistol right here. And so all the tolerances are kind of tight. So let's just see if this works. Okay. So you see how it works. You, now you can't just put this in there you know, but I mean, that wouldn't work. You gotta have a, a plate that wouldn't, see, you'd have something like that, duh. And so what you have is this plate that goes on the back. And so you essentially end up with something that's the same size, see, as that, you know, basically the same, same size. And you've got six little firing pins, spring-loaded firing, I believe they're spring-loaded, little firing pins on it. And so that goes through when the hammer hits it and hits the primer. Okay, pretty clever. I should have thought of that, all right? And these were, you'll see these around, you know, Taylors and Company and uh, R&D basically combined uh, to market these. I think a Howell Old West conversions. It's all the same, same cylinder, okay, same one. And uh, now, that being said, they don't fit every firearm. This one's for the Uberti, which is what this is. This is a Pieta, Navy Arms. This is an old one. I've had that 15, 20 years now, I guess. Bought it up at Friendship. Indiana at the black powder shoot one year and uh, they won't fit in that one for example so you got to make sure that you get it for the right gun and you still might have to do a little dremeling as I understand now this one fits it's tight let's just go ahead and load it and you're supposed to load just lead bullets cowboy loads nothing too powerful these are not for magnums you're still dealing with percussion revolvers not magnums and uh, so this is about right. I think uh, up to around 850 per feet per second, something like that. Still load five. And you put this on. One cool thing about these is if you have one of these revolvers, you can order these without an FFL. They just send it to your house. And uh, then you uh, put it on your gun. You've got a cartridge gun. There we go. Just line up that little indention there. All right. Now I loaded five, and you can see, you notice before I put it in there, we'll play with it here, you can see the case there, they're not shiny, but you can see there's not one in that cylinder, so that helps you when you're trying to line that up. Now I say that, like I say, the tolerances are tight on this, but with my incredible skills, maybe I can get it in here and actually fire it. Kind of turn it clockwise to work that hand properly. Get everything out of the way. There we go. There we go. All right. Now let's find the uh, empty one. There's the empty one. So we want to cock the hammer and let it fall down on an empty chamber. One thing about the, you know, I'm bad or good about dry firing uh, firearms, you know, just to ensure that they're empty, just like you do it in an IPSC match and everything else. It ensures there's nothing on the, under that hammer. On these, it, it highly advises you not to dry fire it because you'll damage that little firing pin. So we won't do that today. All right? Unless I do it by mistake. All right. So let's see if it works. We now have a cartridge gun. Okay? And like I said, one of the interesting things about this is, uh, like Taylor's and Company, when I requested this, they just shipped this to my house. 
you know, no FL required in separate packages, you know, not, not a symbol or anything. So, so you can order one of these cylinders if you have one of these firearms and you've got your conversion. So for wherever you get it, I mean, same thing. All right, now let's see if we can hit that two liter, that's smart Alec. That worked a little better than <laughs> an actual cartridge. And I've shot it, I think about six times. Yeah, it shoots a little high. Yeah, but, so, but uh, windage looks like it's right on. See if it's suitable for a propane tank. Yeah, and we have one left. Let's see if I hit that pot, if I hold low enough, maybe. Yeah, all right, that should be. We won't snap it again because uh, that's the only problem with that. You got to be really sure, don't you? Uh, well, it's not critical. I mean, yeah, I'll uh, bring that around and half cock. Now, I'm going to go ahead and snap it one more time, even though you're not supposed to. I just want to be, make sure uh, we're, we're safe there. Okay, so I'll, I'll make it a point to count next time okay I, I did count I just you know I'm not used to having to be sure all right so there you go and then you just dump them out oh you know one thing I did not uh, bring out here I might need to find a, a stick or something but uh, you, that, you don't have an ejector rod do you you're uh, you're stuck with that so let me see what I've got here on the ground I bet I have a case that would work <laughs> there's a that's a little big a uh don't have anything in my here's a stick oh here's a stick about right okay yeah you gotta punch them out of course if they're tight now that, that was not tight it's just uh not a big big deal there okay so it's a cartridge firing gun now now that said uh what's the advantage if, what if uh, they had had exactly that in 1861 or 62, you know, say the cavalry, you're on horseback, uh, it'd be some advantage. It wouldn't be a dramatic advantage, wouldn't it? Because they like to have lots of these, especially the cavalry. They'd have four or five of these things in their belt, six, eight, <laughs> as many as they could carry, so they would not have to reload. Now, there's an advantage to these, the uh, Remington, because you could change out the cylinders pretty easily, and uh, they would have extra cylinders loaded sometimes. A little risky maybe having them capped and ready to go, but war could be rather risky, so I think I would have taken a chance and have some of those in my pocket capped and ready to go and then put those in. Um, but you, so the bottom line is it works and it's kind of cool, but you do have to take this thing out, you know, and then uh, put, put more ammo in it and then reinstall the cylinder. So it's not like it becomes a semi-automatic, is it? But it, it is more uh, trouble-free. Let's put it that way. <laughs> no doubt about it. Let's try it again. See if it'll work twice. It does give you another option, I think. Uh, we're not talking about uh, combat tactics or anything here with something like this. Or it's just uh, kind of an interesting firearm. And, uh, and also interesting in a historical sense because these were not exactly like this but they were used now here i go wrestling with it it won't come out the other side so i got to get it these are so tight oh, there we go probably if i did this for a few weeks i would get the hang of it there we go all right all right so we have five rounds let's line up drop it on an empty one like right there, and that's an empty one, and let's shoot it again. Let's take out that two liter. Oh, that was impressive. And there's a cowboy. Oh, I must have hit him in the ear. There we go. <laughs> Okay, we're empty. <laughs> that, that's a good looking gun. You know, the, uh, the sheriff's models, a lot of that's just modern marketing. There weren't that many of these guns, you know, cut off like that, but some were. Uh, Gunsmiths would do it, you know. And, uh, 
be a lot handier. I mean, it's a pretty big gun, but compared with that one, it's a lot smaller. Okay, so let's, let's you know, the process. You have cock. There you go. Remember, you got to fire uh, lead loads in it. Dry firing is discouraged. And you also need to do it in a steel frame gun. Uh, some of these things you'll see a brass frame. It needs to be a steel frame firearm. Now keep that in mind. Could require a little fitting. Just depends on your firearm. This one is close to almost being too tight, but it, it fits. I, I guess you'd rather have it go in tightly, but yet you know able to get it in. That'd be the ideal, wouldn't it? Okay. And uh, then you got to get the cases out. There you go. All right. Good thing that stick was handy. I wonder where it came from. All right. It's, it's kind of a neat option. It, it, it really is. And again, they're available for all these models. It doesn't, uh, no matter, almost every uh, percussion revolver out there seems that there's one of these available if uh, they kind of turn you on. Now, one question uh, I know you're thinking, uh, some of you. I, I can read your mind. You're thinking, at least those of you who know, these are 44 caliber, see, 44 caliber says right on the barrel. The uh, you know Remington New Army it was a 44, it's famous for being a 44, just like the the Colt uh, 1860 Army 44 caliber. What are we doing? Putting 45 caliber cartridges in it. You understand? Yeah, okay, I get it. You can put a different cylinder in there and actually fire a cartridge. How's that turn it into a 45? Well, I have no idea. You need to go figure that one out on your own. Or would you like a clue? Okay, I think it is this. The uh, back in the day, these were 44s when they uh, they measured the caliber. Uh, when you talk about cartridges and the caliber and what the designation means, like a uh, 4440 and a 45 set, all that kind of thing, it involves the amount of powder in the case, and sometimes it's uh, it's backwards. There's some weird uh, cartridge designations out there. Sometimes it's just a marketing thing. Oh, it's called a 38. We call it a a 37 or a 36 it won't sell you know and it, that's just fact of life with this i think they uh when they made the barrel before they put the rifling in it it is a 44 caliber pipe basically okay think of a thick pipe it's 44 caliber well then when you cut the grooves in it though the lands the rifling you all know about rifling go see our what twist twist rate video and you know this is rifling well, then you get some deeper grooves in there. Okay, it makes the bullet spin. Well, they were measuring from, I guess, the initial pipe barrel or from the from uh, rifling edge or land, they're called lands. From land to land would be, say, 44 caliber, roughly. But the grooves, the deeper part, from, from groove to groove, would be 45 caliber, like 452, 454. Uh, for that okay so they really are the bottom line is if you didn't understand any of that a 44 one of these 44s even back in the day uh, they were actually 45 caliber by the way we designate them okay so that's why they handle a 45 uh, Colt because those are not those are true 45s one thing about a 45 like a 45 ACP or a 45 Colt they're one of the few cartridges maybe that is exactly that you know where's a 30 uh, 8 is actually a 36 something a 44 magnum is really a 43 and you round down the line but a 45 is actually 45 it's like 452 or 454 thousandths okay just like these are all right now, i knew you were worried about, wondering about that so i just thought i'd let you know we'll see you one more time since we've got this out okay so just an option kind of an interesting thing and, and think about the history of it that's what i always like to look at think about uh any kind of conversion we may get uh, you know, an actual uh, conversion that was made. There are some replicas, like I say, of these that are converted, and they're not exactly like this, but they're they're close, semi-close to what Remington actually made in 1868, and they're they're kind of interesting too. So we might uh, get one of those on the shooting table here one day. So let's put this in, and again, because of your hand there, you want to spin it kind of clockwise to get it, and probably as it gets dirtier and dirtier. It's, it's, there we go. Hey, I'm getting better at it, aren't I? That's a cool little gun. Uh, one thing it allows you to do is to fire these old uh, percussion-looking revolvers 
without all the mess if you want to. You could use black powder cartridges. I, these are smokeless. But again, you don't want anything too, too hot, okay? You want lead rounds, cowboy load, so to speak, steel frame, and uh, have at it. It's pretty neat. So right now what I have in my hand is really the same, even though you gotta go through that process, it's just like having one of my Colt single action armies loaded, right? What's, what would be the difference? Just slower to reload. That's five, because I can see five on that uh, target. So anyway, just a little bit of information about uh, the conversions and the, the Remingtons especially. Uh, and you know, some, something that any of us can do. You can, uh, you can order these. You're taking a chance, I guess, in a way. You may have to do a little fitting, as I understand. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I went ahead and got the Uberti pistol and uh, the conversion cylinder for the Uberti. And that way, pretty, pretty well assured it's going to fit. Uh, and, and it does. I think if I used this a while, it would, uh, it would get easier and easier probably to, uh, to get in there. Uh, so loosen it up a little bit. So pretty cool. I don't know if it's not really an innovation, is it? It's been around a long time. But again, this is kind of a modern thing, this, this particular cylinder. But the concept uh, goes way back. You know, that the concept goes back to uh, 18, late 1860s. And, uh, and there we go. Neat old gun, lots of history there. Life is good.